What I want to talk about is uh, Elizabeth uh, the first and the Elizabethan period, especially as it relates to the Protestant Reformation in England. And so after the, <coughs> the uh, death of Mary, okay, uh, then we have the, the uh, rule of Elizabeth and, and in between here is, uh, is the, uh, Well, I already talked about. It. Okay, so um, so now Elizabeth is the daughter of Henry the Eighth, and uh, she's often referred to as the Virgin Queen. <clears throat> That'll come up a little bit later, um, but uh, and and she there's a lot that happens in the rule of Elizabeth. Uh, she was a major monarch that ruled for a significant period of time and was quite active. And uh, uh, in many ways established uh, the, the foundation of what would later become the English empire that was the largest empire that the world ever had ever seen in, in the 19th century, in the 1800s. Uh, a lot of that legacy goes back to Elizabeth. but. Um, Let's, let's try not to get too complicated here. Uh, I want to focus on the religious stuff because this plays into the English Revolution. And um, so what Elizabeth did is that uh, she was a Protestant and she was um, seems to be a relatively serious about it. It's not just uh, politics for her, but um, but she is a very reasonable and she approaches it very uh, with a lot of moderation considering the time it may not seem so moderate to us now but in comparison to other monarchs uh, she was very very uh, moderate and so she's known for the religious settlement and, and sort of bringing an end to the chaos that the Protestant Reformation was up until this point. And so she issued the Act of Supremacy, uh, which uh, reasserted the Church of England's separation from the Pope and from Roman Catholicism, and then also issued the Act of Uniformity, and, and this is within the first year of her reign. So right after she gets uh, on the front throne, she starts getting to work to sort this out because Queen Mary had reignited the, the, the chaos. And so she's trying to like calm things down. Uh, and then she issues the act of uniformity. And this is what's really unique about Elizabeth's approach to the Reformation is that she didn't want to convince people of a theological position. She's like, I don't care what you believe, you can believe whatever you want, just in public, the only expressions of religion have to be this way. So just, we're gonna do these public performances of religion and everybody's just gonna agree that in public, just what do you believe in your, in your own mind or in your own home? That doesn't matter. We're not looking at that. We're only looking at what's really out in public, <clears throat> which is, you know, uh, much better than, than what was going on, for example, in the Holy Roman Empire, where King Charles was really trying to get Protestants to change their mind. And that, that he was some kind of somehow going to legislate, uh, you know, make it the law that people have to agree with him on theology. That, that doesn't. You know, that's crazy. Um, <clears throat> so we see a, a bit of, of English pragmatism in Elizabeth that uh, goes a long way to solving the problem. There's still a lot of problems, as we will see. Um, she reissues the Book of Common Prayer. Um, 
and she requires all people to attend church. So you have to show up to church. You don't have to believe what the church teaches. You just have to show up. And you have to be there once a week at least, and lots of people would attend church multiple times a week. And um, so, you know, church attendance and going multiple times a week was, was um, very common for Catholics and for Protestants. So all you had to do was just show up once a week, you know, at least most of the time, and nobody would, you know, as long as you just made a showing, you're good. And uh, uh, now if you were causing problems, you know, then you'd be fined. And, and there, were, there were fines. It's like getting a parking ticket. Okay. But they're not going to burn you at the stake and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, nonetheless, there were people who strongly re rejected this approach um, for one reason or another. Um, but it seems to me that one of the one of the reactions was that Elizabeth seemed too bureaucratic and too moderate and not a true believer to many people. It's like if if the Protestant theology is correct, then she should use her power as the monarch to force people to believe. And so you get this reaction that's called uh, the the Puritans. They wanted to purify the Church of England. Um, and, and then some of it was just that the clergy didn't want to conform. They wanted to run their religious ceremonies in the way that they wanted. And so we do have 14 clergy members that are dismissed um, and there are arrests and interrogations and fines of people. I mean, when I say arrests, people are, are taken in for questioning. They're interrogated, they're questioned and fined, uh, but they're not really imprisoned over long periods of time and they're not tortured. It's not the Spanish Inquisition or anything like that. Uh, but this, uh, but this movement of people who just refuse to conform, uh, the London Underground Church, uh, lasts until the 1850s. There's some changes that play, could take place uh, going into the 1850s. Uh, during this time, though, uh, there's the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, so there's an author named Fox. He has a, a book of accounts of people who were martyrs, martyrs over the centuries in Christianity, going back to early Roman times, um, near the time of Jesus, and, and then all the way up until the time of Mary. And so some of the executions, the burnings at the stake that uh, Mary conducted as public spectacles are recounted in Fox's Book of Martyrs, not uh, in the way that Mary intended, but as a demonstration of how uh, awful Roman Catholicism is and how hateful and despicable Mary was. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and that's a very famous book. And that book was really famous all the way up um, into the 20th century. Um, I don't hear people talk about it too much anymore, but it was very, um, it's very, it, I mean, it's pretty well written uh, and the accounts are, you know, pretty harrowing. So, you know, it kind of makes for good reading if you're of a particular bent of mind. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the religious settlement continued. Okay, so then later on, 1751, we have the 39 articles that are added to the Book of Common Prayer. This is sort of making the Church of England a little more structured and clarifying the doctrine. And we also have a book called The Certain Sermons or Homilies Appointed to be Read in Churches. So these are like actual sermons that, uh, that clergy members could use or adapt to their own purposes. And in the, this, this 1970s, uh, 1570s version uh, of the, the theology, it's a lot more Calvinist in bent than the earlier versions, which were maybe a little more leaning to Roman Catholicism. So there is a change in theology, but it's subtle, uh, but it is a way of placating and 
and bringing in the Puritans into the Church of England. So it's a, it's a way of adopting and, in, and incorporating Puritans into the Church of England. Another sign of the pragmatism of Elizabeth. You know, she is, she's really focused on trying to make the Reformation as unchaotic as possible, as unbloody as possible, and to a large extent did a good job. Okay, um, and then uh, something of interest for us is the last remaining serfs. So technically in 1574, there's no more serfs. Okay, but up until that point, there were still remaining serfs, although by this point, obviously, uh, most of the serfs had become um, free tenants, wandering vagabonds, living in the city, you know, or uh, peasant uh, wage earners, you know. So, um, so that's another sort of nail in the coffin of feudalism, as is the religious settlement of, of Elizabeth, because then this really solidifies um, to some extent, but the story is not over, but it really helps to solidify the distinction between uh, or, or, or the independence of the English monarch from the Roman Catholic Church, which was a big part of the feudal order. Okay, so we have this split with the church, we have the elimination of serfs, and so we're starting to erase all the remnants of feudalism. Uh, but what we should think from this long durée historical perspective, well, what is, what is coming, what is replacing it? And uh, it seems that people living at the time really didn't have a sense, oh, we're moving into a new phase and we're replacing feudalism, but with what? And, and, and it's not clear what they're trying to replace feudalism with, especially if you think about it from the perspective of the monarch, uh, the monarchy held the highest position in feudalism. Why would you want to mess that up? But this is, you know, maybe a classic case of hubris, where monarchs were so used to being in power and being privileged that they felt like they could just rearrange things and their position in power would stay the same. Not so, not so. Okay, so that, that's what we're going to see here. All right, so I'm going to stop this video and I'll do the next one.